Um, the first part that Tim says we need to find out is how determinate, how determinate are your ethical values? And I'll type these up at the end in, in case you want to keep track of them. Can your ethical theory help you determine right and wrong behavior? Um, with a lot of the ethical theories in the book, because they were written so long ago, they begin to lose their determinacy, especially when we get into like biomedical or biotechnological issues, because there certainly weren't things like um, gene splicing or cloning or fertility treatments, at least on a genetic level, um, in ancient times or in biblical times if you're using some sort of divine command theory sort of ethic. So how well can your ethical theory tell you what behavior to engage in? Um, another thing Timmons used is consistency. How consistent is your ethical theory? Um, does it tell you to love your neighbor in one chapter and then to wipe out every last one of them in another section? I mean, how do you tell which to go with if it seems to be telling you two different things? So how consistent is your ethical theory and how well is it at determining right or wrong behavior? Okay, the next would be livability. How well can you live up to your ethical theory? Some ethical theories are fantastic, like Kant's categorical imperative, or the kingdom of ends, or Jesus' um, golden rule, or the Sermon on the Mount. But can you really love your neighbor as yourself? Um, can you bless them that curse you? Can you turn the other cheek? I mean, these are beautiful words, but who can live like this? And so that's the question. Do you have such a utopian ethical theory that no human being can possibly live up to it? And so that's another criteria Timmons is looking at. Next is publicity. Can you make your ethical theory known to others? Or if others found out what you really believed, would they ostracize you and avoid you? For example, ethical egoism, which is the first theory we're going to do, um, would not work very well if people found out that you were an egoist and you were only looking out for your own self-interest. And so an egoist has to keep their ethical theory relatively private. Whereas in other ethical theories, um, not only are you public about it, but you want other people to know about your ethical theory. Um, next we have coherence. And this is a really interesting one, or you could say internal support. Um, the following one is going to be external support. But I want to read you what this means here, uh, what Tim said in the book. So this is on coherence or internal support. <clears throat> we all have firm moral convictions about the morality of certain actions. For instance, we believe that the concrete action of intentionally torturing another person for fun is forbidden. But I guess if you're torturing someone for a good reason or to get some good information, then it's okay. Um, furthermore, we agree that certain types of actions, such as lying, theft, kidnapping, murder, rape, are generally forbidden. In fact, widespread agreement exists among people about what actions are right and wrong. Although this fact is obscured because we tend to focus on cases over which there is disagreement and moral belief. Let us call this set of more or less agreed upon beliefs core moral beliefs, beliefs about the morality of actions that we all tend to share and that we hold with some high degree of conviction. Okay, I think that's very interesting. And I think if you were a divine command theorist or a Kantian ethicist, you could talk about core moral values. But if you don't believe in absolute ethical standards, if you believe um, ethics and then their acted out morality are relative, then you can't come up with a short list of torture is wrong, rape is wrong, murder is wrong. I mean, it's hard for me to imagine that Vikings coming back from a, a raid all fell into despondency and guilt and shame when they come out of their longships and they say, oh man, I can't believe we murdered those peasants, or I can't believe we raped those women, or I can't believe we beat up those priests and stole their their relics. and." I just don't see it. I don't see a lot of regret or remorse coming from Vikings, who it was a way of life. So I don't know where they're appealing to this idea of core moral beliefs, unless they're 
they're saying or just uh, as Americans or as Western Europeans or I don't I don't know what that criteria means if you don't believe in an absolute moral standard. Now, like I said, if you're a divine command theorist or a natural law theorist or a Kantian ethicist, you could talk about core moral theory based on either reason or um, the conscience God has put into you or whatever it is. But if you don't believe in those sorts of presuppositions, then I think you're hard-pressed to have core moral values. And then the last one they talk about is called external support. And external support means how well does your ethical theory line up with facts you know about the external world or the world around you. For example, um, long time ago on this island in the South Pacific, um, the greatest taboo on the island was the prohibition of cutting down trees because people believed that the cutting down of trees would result in the sky falling because they believed trees held up the sky with their branches. Well, as time went on and these people on this island had more contact with the West and they'd send their children to schools, uh, their children would come back and they would kind of smile and patronize the old timers because they knew good and well the trees weren't holding up the sky. And as the older generation began to die off and you had this new educated group come in um, who'd been influenced by modern science and materialism, and they began to realize that there was a lot of profit in cutting down these trees. People would pay big money for these rare and exotic woods. And so, even though it was shocking, um, they began to cut down these trees. And they would tell the old people, look, the sky's not falling. It was all just a myth, and we know how the universe really works. Well, in the fullness of time, after all the trees had been cut from the island, and it was denuded, and erosion had set in, and holes began to form the ozone layers, it became quite apparent to everyone that maybe it was a metaphor. The trees weren't literally holding up the sky, but the trees keep the sky healthy by purifying the air, by providing oxygen and all these sorts of things. And so your beliefs about the external world can greatly affect your ethics and morality. That's why a lot of people have one set of standards growing up they go off to college or university, and when they come home after that first semester break, they can be changed people because what they were taught in their youth does not correspond with what they're learning about external reality now. And you can have a complete paradigm shift if your external view of reality changes. It will also affect your internal view on ethics and morality. So I hope that was helpful in looking on how they're going to evaluate ethical theories and if I have time on this video, I'll post up, a, I'll type up a clip so you can see um, exactly what's going on there. All right, egoism next.